The Wisconsin EMS Association thanks you for tuning in to their EMS and fire content. The Wisconsin EMS Association is the largest state-level EMS association in the country. They hope to inspire, educate, and inform you through collaboration with industry leaders. Thank you for your support. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Alan DeYoung. I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin EMS Association. I'm actually joined here today by uh, Chief Steve Hansen from the City of Racine Fire Department. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Steve, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background? Sure, absolutely. So I've been in the fire service for about 39 and a half years. I started with Racine uh, back in 1981. Uh, EMT in 84, uh, paramedic in 98. Uh, so I've been an EMT paramedic for many, many years and also served on a paramedic rescue squad as the company officer for almost 10 years. Uh, about 25 years ago, I wound up getting started in uh, radio communications uh, and radio programming, uh, initially as a way to help our department uh, continuously upgrade our radios as we added interoperability frequencies. And later on, uh, getting involved in the development of the statewide WISCOM radio system that we know today. Uh, this goes all the way back to what was called the System-Wide State Management Group, the SSMG, uh, was the original group that actually helped form and build the WISCOM radio system using PSAC funding, which was federal funding that the state had received uh, to build out the system. Uh, I'm a gubernatorial appointment to the Interoperability Council. Uh, I'm one member that represents uh, fire and EMA, uh, correction, fire and Mavis on the Interoperability Council. There are representatives from uh, State Badger Sheriff, uh, the Wisconsin State Fire Ch uh, Police Chiefs. The uh, Department of uh, Administration is represented there as part of the state. You have State Patrol. You have uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, Department of Natural Resources. So altogether, the Interoperability Council consists of about 15 members who report directly to the governor. Uh, we are a creature of state statute. Uh, we were created by the state statute. And our charge is to facilitate radio communication interoperability and other technological interoperability throughout the state of Wisconsin for public safety and uh, private entities that use public safety communication systems. Uh, I was a presenter at WEMSIS uh, back in November of 2019, uh, presented a program called Can You Hear Me Now that went into some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Wow, it's definitely a lot of experience. I mean, that's, that's, that's huge. Um, so, yeah, with what we're going to be talking about today is going a little bit into interoperability, WISCOM, kind of a little bit about all those things. So starting out, what is, what is Herc Region 7? Okay, so how this all ties into EMS communications, uh, you have, uh, uh, we're part of, uh, in southeast Wisconsin here, we're part of HERC Region 7. And that stands for the Wisconsin Healthcare Emergency Readiness Coalition. This is a group of uh, hospitals and uh, providers, EMS providers, uh, that have put together a program to help facilitate uh, critical emergencies within the region. There are seven HERC regions located throughout the state of Wisconsin. Uh, here in Southeast, we're part of uh, Region 7. Uh, at the present time, I'm the WISCOM subject matter expert for HERC Region 7. So I have 31 hospitals that I work with on a regular basis, from Fond du Lac to Kenosha to uh, Waukesha up through uh, um, Ripon. Uh, that uh, are on the WISCOM system. So I work directly with the emergency room and the emergency management folks uh, that oversee uh, hospital operations to make sure that their WISCOM radio systems are operational. To make sure that WISCOM is working in these emergency rooms, we do conduct weekly radio checks, and uh, we get between 85 and 90% compliance with those weekly radio checks, which are on uh, Wednesday mornings about 8 a.m. Those radio checks are to ensure the functionality of the radios and that the system is actually working as designed. And I must say we've had a really good track record of those uh, WISCOM radios working well in the emergency departments. Wow, that's really good. Really good to hear. I mean, that's that's good uh, success rates with that and keeping it going. What Could you tell us a little about, you know, the importance of radio communications? 
So radio communications, it's just one avenue that uh, field EMS units have to communicate with the hospitals. Uh, obviously, there are other uh, communication paths that are available. Uh, more common ones are your cellular communications, your text messaging. Uh, but radios remains uh, one of the primary means of contacting an emergency room uh, for field agencies. Now, VHF radios are required for all ambulances under Department of Health Services 110.04.76 and also TRANS 309.18-1. Those two uh, documents, which are state statutes and rules, require that a permanently mounted radio uh, be installed in every ambulance uh, to allow you to contact the uh, emergency departments. These uh, radios must have a microphone and speaker permanently installed in the patient compartment. So one of the things that we want to make sure that all your listeners are aware of is that if you're providing an ambulance service in your area, whether you're private or whether you're a municipal-based uh, agency that you are required to have a VHF radio in your ambulance. Under TRANS 209, um, or 309, I'm sorry, uh, requires uh, remote two-way communications from your personnel when they are away from the ambulance. So again, according to state statutes, uh, as your members move away from the ambulance, they should have a portable radio with them so that they can maintain contact not only with the ambulance, but also their dispatchers. Also, as part of this requirement, uh, there is uh, certain channels that must be programmed into your radios, uh, and these are all VHF frequencies. Those uh, channels are EMSB, EMSA, EMSC, Mark I, and Mark II. And for systems uh, such as in uh, Racine and Walworth County, you have the option of programming in what are called med channel pairs, which are in the 450 megahertz range. Those are required as part of uh, the state's uh, uh, emergency communications plan. Now, all of these requirements are available in a document called the Wisconsin Emergency Medical Services Communication Plan. This is a document that's online and available to be downloaded uh, from the state website, and it goes into a lot of detail on what you need to have available to you in terms of communication. Uh, so these are things that uh, you need to be aware of. Uh, and as your ambulances are inspected periodically by the state, they're looking for these things as well. So the more you know about this, the better off you're going to be. And really, this is all about patient care. When you're dealing with a patient, being able to convey that information from the ambulance to the emergency department so that they can appropriately prepare for that incoming patient. Now, of course, uh, we've heard a lot of conversation about uh, cellular communications and a lot of ambulances do in fact use cellular communication to talk to emergency departments. And there's nothing wrong with that. The challenge that you're going to have, though, and we've all experienced this with uh, cell phones, is sometimes as field units you have uh, poor coverage. You know, you lose a signal and you can't talk to the hospital. If you're using a flip phone inside of an ambulance, which is basically a tin can, your signal is degraded and may not get to the cell tower or may be broken up and you may have poor communications with uh, the hospital. The flip side or the, the pros of cellular phones is that it's more secure communication. It's less likely to be listened in on by people who shouldn't be getting that type of information. The other thing that we need to look, about, look at uh, when we're talking about communications is uh, hospital telephone systems. So these are all points of failure. Your cell phones and your hospital uh, phone systems are points of failure. In the hospitals, many of them use what's called an internet protocol-based phone system, an IP-based phone system, digital phone systems. When uh, those systems are in place, there are things like network switches and routers that control how those signals move throughout the hospital. If one of those network switches or routers fails for whatever reason, you're going to have areas of the hospital that are going to lose their phone service, and we know that this has happened periodically. So it's something to be cognizant of is radio communication is a redundant piece of equipment that helps you get around some of these other challenges. And, of course, that's not to say that radios don't fail either because they certainly can fail. So for field EMS providers, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we have multiple ways to contact our emergency departments whether it's cell phones, whether it's radios, uh, and just recognize that these all assist us in providing the best patient care possible. 
So the other thing uh, with uh, cellular coverage, and this is something that doesn't get talked about a lot, is when you have bad weather come through an area. So think in terms of uh, severe weather, tornadoes, straight line winds, uh, other significant weather events where there's a lot of damage done within a very short time period. What happens and what we've seen historically across the nation is when these things happen, the cellular phone networks get overcrowded. Uh, each cell tower can only handle so many phone calls at one time. Whether it's uh, you know, 50, 100, 200 calls, cell towers have limited capacity in terms of handling phone calls. You have a tornado come through your area. What's the first thing people do? They get on their cell phones to call their neighbors, their friends. Mm -hmm. Hey, are you okay? When that happens, once a tower gets overloaded, no other cell signals can get through. In terms of EMS field providers, if you're transporting patients to the hospital that are injured and you're trying to call a patient report in, if the closest tower is overloaded, you're not going to get your uh, report through to the emergency department. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that you need to consider and think about in terms of communications uh, with your field ambulances and with the emergency departments. Interesting. So... Would you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, WISCOM and the, the regional state coverage and kind of how that works? Absolutely. So WISCOM is a, a statewide radio system uh, under the care of the State Patrol and Department of Transportation. They maintain 130 plus tower sites throughout the state of Wisconsin. These tower sites are all linked together by microwave connections that allow them to share information and radio traffic between towers depending on what channel you're on, and who you're trying to talk to. The state system guarantees statewide mobile coverage. In other words, the radio that you have in your ambulance uh, is capable of hitting the WISCOM system anywhere within the state of Wisconsin, mobile coverage. We really don't have a guarantee on portable or walkie-talkie type coverage, although in a lot of areas of the state, we have really good radio portable coverage uh, depending on the sites and where they're located. Um, portable radio coverage is very dependent on terrain. Uh, it's also very dependent on uh, electrical interference in, in your area. Think in terms of fluorescent lights, computers, uh, power substations. They all generate radio frequency noise that can potentially interfere with portables. Now, when you're looking at the difference between a portable and a mobile radio, uh, we use the analogy in the fire service of water pressure. Your mobile radio, which is your vehicle-mounted radio, is putting out 50 pounds of pressure. We call it watts. That allows that signal to travel a long distance. Your walkie-talkies, on the other hand, depending on what frequency band they're in, are only putting out 3 to 5 watts of pressure radio signal, and that's why they don't travel as far, and that's why they have some difficulty reaching the towers. So you got to think about this in terms of water pressure. You know, how far does 3 to 5 pounds of water pressure go versus 50 pounds of water pressure? And really, that understanding that basic concept of how radios operate gives you an idea on how far your signal is going to travel. Mobile signals are going to travel much further and hit more towers versus walkie-talkies, which will travel a shorter distance so you need more towers, in theory, to be able to hear those uh, portable signals. So the other thing about WISCOM is, is we have different types of users on the system at the present time. Everybody is considered an interoperability user, which means we will never charge you for accessing the system. Uh, then we have daily users. Uh, these are communities like Fond du Lac, Kewanee County, Iowa County, who have chosen to use WISCOM on a daily basis for their daily operations. And while they pay no fees for that, uh, they do sometimes have to enhance the local coverage to get that walkie-talkie coverage, which means adding towers and sites uh, to make sure that they can cover their, their officers and their EMTs and firefighters. So we have uh, daily users. Uh, we have a number of those on the system. We have interoperability users. I think it's also important to point out that we also have aeromedical on WISCOM. For example, Flight for Life, Med Flight. The helicopters tend to have uh, the WISCOM radios available to them, and they actually have talk groups or channels on the system that allow them to communicate back and forth between their base and their helicopters so they can monitor what's going on. 
It also means that the helicopters can have long-range communications with hospitals that they might be inbound from 100 miles out, Mm -hmm. which is a good thing. WISCOM also has what are called ISSI gateways. These are, the technical term is inter-subsystem interface. And it's a fancy term that basically means that two separate radio systems can talk to each other, mainly trunking systems. And I'll use the example, Dane County has a trunking radio system. They have an ISSI gateway between their system and WISCOM that allow certain channels to cross over between the two systems. And from an end user standpoint, it's transparent. But from a functionality standpoint, it allows a talk group on Dane County to talk to a WISCOM talk group, depending on the needs. There is also an ISSI gateway uh, in the Milwaukee, Waukesha area for Oasis in WISCOM. WISCOM's in the process of implementing uh, ISSI gateways with the state of Illinois. So certain talk groups in Wisconsin will function in Illinois and vice versa. We have an ISSI interface with Minnesota and the Armor system that allows certain talk groups to go back and forth, especially for our communities that are along uh, the borders of those states. So we have a lot of technology in place that allows us that much broader interoperability connectivity with agencies not only within our state, but with agencies in bordering states. At the present time, we're also working on an ISSI interface with the state of Michigan. Everybody says, well, wait, that's across Lake Michigan. (laughs) Yeah, not really. Uh, we got this little piece uh, called Upper UP Michigan that is adjacent to Wisconsin. And while people don't realize it, there tends to be mutual aid back and forth between the two uh, states uh, up in the UP area there. It should have been Wisconsin to begin with. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. So, so I, I'm curious now um, with Wiscom and the you know upgrading of the system. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, absolutely. So uh, about two years ago, the state was looking at uh, issuing a request for proposals to upgrade the WISCOM radio system. Uh, they determined that they wanted to step back and take a different approach to upgrading the WISCOM system. So what they did was they created uh, an executive committee uh, with uh, members of the Interoperability Council and others, and they formed what's called a Request for Information Group. This is an executive study group. RFI. And our charge, and I was a member of that group, along with uh, Sheriff Matt Josky from uh, Kiwanee County, uh, our charge was to look at vendor proposals and evaluate the different types of technologies that they are suggesting be incorporated into a new system. So really what we were trying to do is, as we rebuild WISCOM, upgrade the system, if you will, How do we build new technologies into that to future-proof WISCOM and make it more readily available to everybody out in the the public safety community, in the EMS community? So just one, uh, so that process is going to come to a conclusion here in the next 30 to 45 days. At that point, the recommendations of the Executive Summary Committee will go to uh, the Adjutant General with a recommendation but in the meantime, uh, we are doing a, a uh, interoperability council meeting where we are soliciting input from fire, EMS, law enforcement, and other entities who will be using the system in the future and see how they feel about uh, different aspects of the proposal that will go to the adjutant general for a recommendation to the legislature for funding. So we're looking at, uh, uh, you talk about some of the technology, some of the technology we're looking at is uh, things like interfacing your cell phone with the WISCOM system. There are a number of us that already have cell phones that are on what's called the Harris Beyond app. That allows us to actually talk on WISCOM using our cell phones. These phones are not for mission critical type uh, environments, but it allows managers and officers and even hospitals to be able to communicate with uh, field WISCOM radios using uh, an app that you can install on your phone. Now, the Harris Beyond app is one app. Uh, there are other apps uh, from AT&T and others that will allow us to interface WISCOM with cellular technology. Again, what's out there? What can we take and how can we use that in the future to support uh, 
field uh, EMS and fire units and improve their ability to communicate. So those are some of the things that we went through in the request for information. Uh, one of the things that the state is looking at is the possibility of moving the entire system to 800, although there is a lot of conversation about maintaining VHF in the more rural areas of the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it stands right now, the, the state system actually is VHF 800. And when I say that, you have certain areas of the state that uh, have what are called 800 megahertz overlays. Uh, think in terms of like your Milwaukee and Waukesha County, your Fox Valley, your Green Bays, mm -hmm. your La Crosse's, your Dane counties. They have local systems that operate on 800 megahertz, so we have an overlay in place that will take an 800 megahertz signal and replicate that on the VHF side and vice versa, VHF's WISCOM signal and replicate it on uh, 800. So those are things that we're looking at. Uh, technology, we're trying to future-proof this communication system so that it'll be so a solid performer for the next mm -hmm. 15 to 20 years. So, could you, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the emergency operations end of this? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so on the emergency operations end of things, uh, WISCOM, what it does is it allows you not only local WISCOM communication capability, but it also allows, allows you for long-range communications. Excuse me. <clears throat> so think of your ambulances that are doing, for example, interfacility transports. You might have an ambulance going from Fond du Lac to Madison or from uh, Wausau to Madison. If you're on WISCOM, you can maintain connectivity with that ambulance during its entire journey. The other advantage of that long-range communication is being able to have that ambulance crew call the receiving emergency department and talk, uh, give a patient update. If the patient is improving, if the patient is not improving, uh, vitals, uh, EKGs, you can contact that receiving hospital while you're still 50, 60 miles out and give them an update on your patient. So those are the long-range uh, communication capabilities of WISCOM. We have uh, dedicated talk groups for the hospitals. <clears throat> uh, Region 7 has a talk group. It's called HRCRD7. Uh, this talk group is uh, used within our southeast Wisconsin hospitals to allow the 31 hospitals to talk to each other. Uh, the other HERC regions also have these talk groups available. If you have a major incident, your incident commanders being able to get on the radio on a WISCOM talk group uh, in the case of Southeast Wisconsin, it's HRCRD7, and being able to notify all 31 hospitals that you have a major casualty incident and how many patients they might expect to receive. That is called a one-to-many communications. So you're giving a heads up to these emergency departments so that they can prepare to receive patients. They may have to call in extra staff. They may have to pull staff off the floor. They may have to call in surgeons. <clears throat> that all takes time. If your emergency incident commander can get on the radio and with one radio call mm -hmm. notify 31 hospitals, I got 100 patients. Mm -hmm. These are the different categories, red, white, uh, red, yellow, or green, or black. Mm -hmm. And what the estimated time that they'll be arriving the hospitals have a better w chance to prepare for those patients. Uh, every hospital has a dedicated talk group on WISCOM, so they have their own private channel in, in addition to the regional channel. Every hospital has the ability to encrypt their transmissions so that we are HIPAA compliant. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, aeromedical communication capabilities on WISCOM are there. And again, this is another redundant communication path uh, in addition to cellular phone and other forms of communication, text messaging, that allows you to get your message through to these emergency departments. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've talked about quite a bit here. Um, I wonder if we can kind of sum it all up in, in as little as we can here about everything. Absolutely. So in conclusion, uh, WISCOM uh, provides significant interoperability communications. Uh, WISCOM provides for short and long-range communications. WISCOM is here to stay, and it's incumbent upon us as EMS providers to take advantage of the system. Uh, the state built the system. We just have to take advantage of it. Uh, one of the things that I would urge everybody to do is when you buy a new piece of apparatus, 
to actually build the cost of a trunking radio into the cost of that ambulance instead of moving the old radio. And that new radio needs to be WISCOM capable, which means it needs to be trunking capable and digital capable. Uh, we've seen uh, agencies will spend two, three hundred thousand dollars for a new ambulance, uh, building five or six thousand dollars into that cost to upgrade your radio communications gives you so much more capability, not only in your local area, but across the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're doing the same thing with the fire service and obviously with uh, law enforcement, you know, as you replace your units. Make sure you build the cost of that radio into the ambulance. Now, it's not to say you have to have all your portables on WISCOM because you don't really need that, but your ambulances should have a WISCOM-capable radio in there on the state talk groups. The only other thing that I would mention before we conclude today is uh, – FirstNet. Uh, FirstNet is the uh, federal government's uh, solution through AT&T to provide connectivity both for data and cellular connectivity on a nationwide basis. This is a network that's being built out by AT&T uh, in Wisconsin here. They are in the process of adding almost 100 towers throughout the state of Wisconsin to accommodate FirstNet. FirstNet also has a special radio band set aside just for FirstNet users, and this is typically called band 14. So think about it this way. Uh, on FirstNet, if you're driving through from uh, Milwaukee to Chicago, you're on I-94, you're heading south, you got four lanes of traffic heading south, and in the morning and in the evening, those lanes are jammed, right? Band 14 is an entirely separate freeway with no cars on it. So imagine being able to get more data through much more quickly than if you stayed on I-94. So this would be like a separate, this would be a 594 that runs parallel to 94, but mm-hmm. the only people that are allowed on there are FirstNet people. Mm. So you know, from a service standpoint and an emergency standpoint, uh, as video and other data needs become more readily available and used, this band 14 will allow fire and EMS providers the opportunity to put that, use that bandwidth to get their information either through to their incident command center, uh, to their dispatch center, or to their emergency operations center. So as you're looking at your uh, future plans here, you know, FirstNet needs to be part of that as well. Uh, You obviously have to have a mobile router, and then you have to have a special FirstNet SIM card. The other advantage is on FirstNet is if you're an AT&T subscriber and you're a member of an EMS agency, you can get a subscriber FirstNet phone that gives you those capabilities as well, and the cost is very, very reasonable. Hmm. Uh, You would need to talk to your AT&T folks about that, but uh, it might be something that you would consider to help your, uh, your volunteers maintain connectivity. There are different options that are available. Obviously, the cellular and texting is uh, all part of the package. You can get tethering uh, on your phone. You can also get push-to-talk features that allow you to communicate between each other. So in closing, uh, we've covered a lot of technology here. We would uh, be willing and open to questions that come down the line here. Mm Uh, The best thing to do is stay in contact with the Wisconsin EMS Association and your other associations as they are your best source for up-to-date information as they're on top of things here. So with that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. This has been a, a tremendous amount of information. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's really good, interesting. I'm, I'm learning quite a bit myself, and I hope others are, are as well. So thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me today. Really appreciate it.